thank you. So Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurus rex. I mean, we've all grown up having different views of Tyrannosaurus rex, and I'm just looking around the room at the age groups because what we think of when we think of Tyrannosaurus rex is going to change depending on our age. And I think through this program, we're going to get the, uh, an opportunity to appreciate that, that a little bit. So, 1915, Tyrannosaurus rex, the very first one, goes on display at the American Museum of Natural History with great fanfare and great hyperbole. And if there's one thing that paleontologists love, it's hyperbole. And if there's one thing that surrounds Tyrannosaurus rex, it's hyperbole. And these are just quotes from the first opening of Tyrannosaurus rex, the ambassador to science, the icon for paleontology, the prize fighter of antiquity, the last of the great reptiles and king of them all, the most formidable fighting animal of which there is any record whatsoever, royal man-eater of the jungle. Okay, I'm not really on board for that one. Um, King of all kings in the domain of animal life. I guess we had to qualify that. There's a king of kings, and then there's the king of kings of animal life. The absolute warlord of the earth. My favorite one. The absolute warlord of the earth. The ne plus ultra I bring to you Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, 1915, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing this in the newspaper. This is the new thing. This animal, you've heard the buzz. It's, it was discovered 10 years earlier, but it didn't actually go on display until 1915 at the American Museum of Natural History. And it was actually discovered by a, a fellow by the name of Barnum Brown, who was named after the, the P.T. Barnum in the same tradition. Um, he discovered the first Tyrannosaur in 1902. He actually discovered a second one in 1908. So we're going to learn that, that it was, I, I can't remember the exact date, but it was about 50 years between the time the second Tyrannosaur was found and the third Tyrannosaur was found. But the first two were found by the same guy, Barnum Brown. This guy a little bit lucky here. He found two Tyrannosaurs. Who in this room has found two Tyrannosaurs? Found it in Montana, and I'm going to say it was on BLM-administered lands, but it was actually 1902s, uh, just south of Glasgow, Montana. So that's actually, if you if you track that about 35 miles south of Glasgow, you're either in uh, reclamation lands or you're on fish and wildlife lands or adjoining BLM lands. Uh, pretty, pretty good guess it was public lands, though, since we're at Interior right now. We'll go with that. Yes. Yes, and that's exactly where Jack Horner has been uh, has excavated a number of tyrannosaurs, which we'll we'll see here. Um, but that's the area around F uh, Fort Peck Reservoir in Montana. In uh, 1905, the animal was described by Henry Fairfield Osborne and a fellow by the name of Matthew put out this the very first uh, uh, illustration of tyrannosaurus. So, to the world, this is what tyrannosaurus rex looked like kind of a, a sketchy little drawing in 1905. It really didn't capture the imagination until 1915 when it went on display and people saw this enormous beast. Uh, it was just, just nothing to compare it to. Um, but the only thing they knew about it was that it was a slow, lumbering, stupid reptile, right? Well, it was also the king of kings of the animal world and the, and the most terrible beast ever. It took only three years for it to, to make the transition from the front of the museum into, the, uh, into cinema. And this is where dinosaurs stayed for the next 70 years. You didn't hear a lot of research on dinosaurs. You kept hearing about dinosaurs taking over this, dinosaurs taking over the lost world. And if you go back to the, to the 1920s and all of this, the early films from the 20s, if you were to ask anyone on the street to name 10 films from the, from the 1920s, well, at least in my generation, ask me to name 10 films from the 1920s, nine of those 10 are going to be the lost world. I mean, that's the only one I know of. I think Zorro came out in that time, too, so that would be my, my number two. Um, 1933, that, you know, Tyrannosaurus rex finally 
finally is the big bad guys the you know if you want to come up with a bigger badder bad guy you know who who can you come up with better than tyrannosaurus rex and who is a worthy opponent to king kong i mean there is no other worthy opponent uh, than Tyrannosaurus Rex. And this is how we see it. It was in 1941, I think, that uh, the American Museum sold one of its two Tyrannosaurs to the Carnegie Museum. $100,000. That's a lot of money. One museum selling it to another. Uh, Carnegie Museum put it on display in 1945. So now the public has two dinosaurs to look at. And this one is, is largely fabricated, you know, casts uh, uh, taken from the other specimen. There's not a lot of real bone uh, in this specimen uh, just because there wasn't a lot discovered. I, I don't remember if it's 20% complete somewhere in, in, that, in that realm. So by 1945, there's two specimens and probably about 20 movies about Tyrannosaurus rex, and that's what we know about Tyrannosaurus rex at that time. And during this time, there's also two extremely, I think, very influential murals. And I would say anybody who grew up, say, before the 1980s, when you say Tyrannosaurus rex, you're going to think of one of these two murals. Uh, the top one is Charles R. Knight from the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. That thing was in every one of my childhood books. That thing was in every encyclopedia. That photo was everywhere. And the other photo was our kind of our bloated fellow down here at the bottom. Uh, and that one's uh, uh, a mural at the Peabody Museum of Natural History in New Haven, Connecticut at Yale. And uh, one of these two images of Tyrannosaurus rex. And in fact, the Yale Peabody uh, mural inspired every toy I grew up with. Every little dinosaur plastic toy was one of these little bloated, slow-moving reptile things, as was, I think, most of the people in this room. And so that's what we knew. Between 1902 and 1988, Tyrannosaurus rex had, was mostly known from either the cinema or from this artwork or from these great pictures we'd seen from the museums. But what did we know about the research behind it? What did we know about who its friends were, what it was doing? All we knew is that he fought with Triceratops. We all knew that. And we all pretty much had that down. And, uh, but other, other than that, what did we know about Tyrannosaurus? Was it a solitary animal? Did it hunt in packs? Did it live up in the mountains? Did it live down by the, you know, the ocean? We didn't know anything about the animal. Did it like flowers? Did it like, we didn't know anything about the animal. It was just, that was all we knew. And I was uh, reading in the last couple of days, doing a lot of reading about Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, and, and there was one of the big question, and, and I'm not the only person who've asked the question. It seems like when you think something like that, you find out other people have asked the same question. Why did we not do anything with Tyrannosaurus rex for the first, you know, uh, 80 years? Why do why didn't we look into it? Well, one uh, analysis I read, which, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not, was that, that this was a time of theoretical science. This is the time when real science was genetics, physics, you know, putting a man on the moon. I guess that, you know, goes from theoretical to doing something. But paleontology, is that a real science now? That's what children do. That's what kids do. That's the gateway to science. You know, we're still using that. That jingle today. Oh, it's the gateway drug to science. Do do fossils. Uh, hyperbole. Okay, I do it too. Um, but it was always this idea that that oh, well, this is what children do. This is what children love, and then they get into real science later on. Someday they'll get into real science. And it and it occurred to me because, um, and this is just the synthesizing going on here. I read the exact same article a few weeks ago during uh, National Bike Month. If you remember the late um, 19th century and early 20th century, huge bicycle culture, bicycles everywhere. Sports heroes were cyclists, you know? I mean, you can't say Lance Armstrong. Name a famous cyclist today. See? You know, cycling. Um, but and what happened in the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s? Who rides bicycles? Children. It's a kid's thing. We ride bikes. And even today, you know, I, I'm an avid cyclist. And even today when I'm going to work, oh, you like to ride your bike to work. Isn't that cute? And it's like, no, actually, this is, 
this is serious stuff, you know. I spend thousands of dollars on bicycles every year, you know. It's the same thing in paleontology. It's come full circle. It's not just what the children are doing. Paleontology, something big is going on. So when did that transition happen between it being a kid's thing and some, some very you know, serious science going on? And, and it starts with two books that came out in 1988. And it seems like these things come out in twos and threes. You know, It's never just like one book that changes the world. It's like, boom, two of them. And in the world of paleontology, two books came out. One, Jack Horner. How many people here have heard the name Jack Horner before? See? You can't name a, a famous cyclist today, but you know Jack Horner. And Bob Bakker. Um, and, and two very, very different people. Um, both of them worked as advisors in the first Jurassic Park. Both of them became spokespeople for paleontology. Both of them work, or at least worked, on Tyrannosaurus rex. When you talk about paleontology, it goes to dinosaurs. And when you talk about dinosaurs, it goes to Tyrannosaurus rex. If you're a paleontologist, you learn to hate Tyrannosaurus rex. Everything's about Tyrannosaurus rex. But what do I? OK, I work with Tyrannosaurus rex. I mean, it's just, you know, it's what you end up doing. Two books are very influential. Um, not as much in the profession as it was outside the profession. It made it accessible. Jack Horner, this is a guy we can relate to. You know, he's working a blue collar job, doing some work, gets a MacArthur Genius Grant, and becomes one of the most famous paleontologists ever. Well, you know, it wasn't because he was given the grant, it's the other way around. <laughs> uh, this guy's amazing. And if, if you've ever had a chance to, to meet Jack Horner or, or read his books, I mean, he has just this amazing insight and, and vision that dinosaurs might be just a little bit more than just finding some cool skulls, putting on display, and making toys for kids. Um, Bob Bakker said, um, again, this is something the public hadn't heard, and the sciences had been talking about it for about 100 years, actually. Um, Bob Bakker didn't come up with anything original. He packaged it in an original way and, and just boom, and made a huge impact. Maybe dinosaurs weren't slow, sluggish, lumbering, stupid reptiles. What if they were more like birds jumping around, doing active things? What if they had feathers? Thus the name the heresies. What if birds had feathers? Or what if dinosaurs had feathers? And what we grew up with, <laughs> yeah, right, they had feathers. You know, right, right. And whales are related to cows. You know? and, and if you notice in the last 10 years, guess what we've just learned? Whales are kind of closely related to hippopotamus. You know? Strange things in science, heresies, until you kind of crash through and think about it. In 1990, something else very big happened, and that is a Tyrannosaurus was found on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. This in and of itself was, you know, a notable scientific discovery, very interesting. Uh, it was the most complete one found, almost complete, fully complete, and, and any fossil finding complete is unusual. Normally, when you hear in the news that a complete anything is found, here's a dirty secret. That means they have found more than 50%. <laughs> if it's more than 50%, we'll, we'll, we'll say it's mostly complete, right? That's where the mostly comes in. This thing is nearly complete. I, I, I don't know the number. I'd say better than 90% complete, though. Uh, an amazing specimen. Um, follows up with some notable things. And if you're working for the Bureau or, or in the Department of Interior at the time, maybe you heard some of this. Maybe you grew up hearing some of this. Um, those bad federal agents went in and, and took this fossil away from these poor, hardworking folks. Um, uh, turns out, oh, there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes. Who knew, you know? Uh, Cheyenne River tribe uh, thought, you know, um, maybe this uh, Tyrannosaur belongs to the, to the tribe. Uh, the rancher, which is said, actually, it's mine. It's not theirs. It belongs to me. Um, the federal government, actually, this belongs to the American people. This is a uh, belongs thing. This thing went through court case after court case after court case. Institute sues for Sue. My favorite clipping, which I couldn't find to, to here, but I, I'll find, is, is, is the one that says, the Sue, Sue for Sue. <laughs> um, but this went on for years. Um, and... Um, FBI was involved. There were criminal indictments uh, filed. There were criminal uh, uh, findings. I mean, you know, uh, people went to jail. Uh, I guess, you know, fossils stolen from public lands. I mean, it was a little more than just 
a tyrannosaur. It started with the discovery of a tyrannosaur, ended in a big, long thing, uh, a chapter we're very happy to put behind us. But then it goes into something else that started happening in the 1990s that was very big and still affects the profession today in a ex very dramatic way. And that is the idea that fossils are worth money and not just making movies, but we can actually sell these things. And all through the 1990s, this became huge in the profession because now it wasn't go out west and find yourself a tyrannosaur. It was go out west and sell yourself a tyrannosaur. Pay off that mortgage, you know, especially if you're a rancher out west. If you could find a dinosaur on your land, you know, pay back the bank, take control. I mean, the American dream. And um, that, was, that was very threatening to, to a lot of the sciences, scientists, to museums. Like, I don't know, now... $8.36 million for a tyrannosaur. Um, and those are questions that are, are still being asked today. I think it's settled down a lot. We've understood it. You know, fossils on private land belong to the private individual. The fossils on public lands are now protected under law and belong to the American public. And as land managers, we are required to, to manage them as such. The rules are kind of settling down now. Like now we know we know what the rules are. We can play by the rules. We don't have to like the rules, but at least we're all playing by the same rules now. So. Is it frowned upon or are there rules against the museums paying millions of dollars to buy one of these things? From the price Everyone has their own opinion on whether a a museum should or should not buy a specimen. There's arguments either way. As long as it's legal, it's legal. There's no problem. Uh, the Field Museum of Natural History uh, put together $8.36 million for a tyrannosaur, and then they kept it in the public trust. So is that OK? Is it not? I mean, that gets into a question of ethics that, that can go every direction. And, and it, those questions are still being asked, and hopefully those questions will always be asked, uh, because they are very important. Um, also in the 1990s, though, something new happened. And we started talking about, well, let's look at some real research on whether Tyrannosaurus rex was warm-blooded. Let's look for DNA in these bones, you know? I mean, Jurassic Park, yeah, you didn't get complete DNA, so you just stick some frog DNA in there, and then you have dinosaurs, you know? You saw the movie, Peresto, a dinosaur. I mean, that's all you have to do. But now we're having some real research going on, some understanding some real things that are happening, and the jump that has happened since the 1990s to today where you won't see a paper in paleontology with a single author on it. And that's in most of the sciences. But now there's rare earth elemental analysis looking for the geochemical fingerprinting and the geochemical signatures behind these bones. There's uh, oxygen isotope, there's a carbon isotope. Let's see what the weather was like when this animal died. Let's see if they was living in a climate shadow that had lots of rain or not so much rain. Geochemistry has completely taken over paleontology. Um, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's a little scary too. I was like, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a wizard in chemistry. I wanted to work on fossils, but now, if you want to work on fossils, you're going to work in chemistry too. You're going to be a physicist. You're going to be a good biologist. You're going to know your anatomy. I mean, or you assemble a good team of people who can cover all those bases. Some real science happening now, not just digging them up and sticking them up on the uh, up in the museum and saying, oh, isn't that pretty? We're still doing that too. But 1992. You know, and I knew we'd get groans from this one, but how many people have grown up with Barney? How many people had one of their first great friends was a dinosaur? You know, I mean, and there's not a lot of connections to the science there, but it brought it into the psyche. Tyrannosaurus is no longer the villain. Still has an opportunity to be a villain now and then, because a year later, and almost to the day, a year later, we come up with another movie. And it's been a long time since we'd seen a movie on dinosaurs. And when we got one, boy, did we get one. And that's, so there he is again. And what's wonderful about this, this is like the, the, the revisionist Western, which was kind of going on in the 1990s, too. Uh, this Jurassic Park came out, I think, six months after, or just a year after um, uh, Unforgiven, you know, the, the very gritty, non-traditional Western. And it's the same thing with Tyrannosaurus. Is Tyrannosaurus the villain of Jurassic Park, or is it the hero of Jurassic Park? Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> you think about it, at the very end of the movie, when those velociraptors, who are definitely the villains, who saved them from the velociraptors? It was Tyrannosaurus Rex. 
who saved the heroes from the lawyer? <laughs> it was the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah, see? And what is more scary than having a Tyrannosaur going after two cars? Having two Tyrannosaurs going after one car. Yeah, it gets better and better. And then it got a little forget forgettable in Jurassic Corp 3. And a true story about this one, it was, it was 2005, because I remember where I was. I was in a video store. I found Jurassic Park 3 in a little sale bin. I'm like, whoa, there's a third one? I mean, I'm a professional paleontologist. Of course, I don't have a television. I don't go see movies. I was working out in the park at the time. But still, I was like, wow, I should buy this. See, check it out. I, I, I really enjoyed the movie, but it was kind of, kind of, you know, miss me. But you know why this one flopped? There's only one reason. Spinosaurus can take out Tyrannosaurus? Oh, come on, really? Oh, you know, Spinosaurus, he doesn't even look dangerous. Anyway, that, that, that's, that's my analysis there. We're waiting for Jurassic Park 4. This will be Advance of the Mammals. It hasn't come out yet, but, you know, here we go. And this is actually a, a painting by Luis Ray, who's done a huge amount of dinosaur art, and we'll see a little bit of it later on here. Um, I, I worked in a graduate program full of dinosaur folks. And um, my advisor worked on dinosaurs. Uh, the other folks in my laboratory worked on dinosaurs. There are half a dozen well-known paleontologists who are working in the laboratory with me doing dinosaurs, dinosaur paleontologists. I didn't touch dinosaurs. So I commissioned this piece of work while I was in graduate school, brought it to my advisor. He is the one and only person who was not amused. I think this is hilarious. He was not amused. He just thought that was so disrespectful. <laughs> Could have been my attitude when I showed it to him, you know. <laughs> but um, anyway, it, it, it's a fun thing because, and what this is really though is that paleontology is so much more than just Tyrannosaurus. You know, there, there's other things going on, and and yet I walk around DC saying, yeah, I work on dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I do dinosaurs. Uh, paleontology, yeah, that's dinosaurs. Archaeology, that's dinosaurs, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so let's talk about Tyrannosaurus. You know, from 1905 to 1970, we just knew about Tyrannosaurus. And in 1970, it's pretty obscure. Not many of us, like, picked up the newspaper on that morning in 1970 and said, oh, my God, there's another Tyrannosaur from, from Canada. This one's called Daspolitosaurus. And Daspolitosaurus isn't really a household name. Tyrannosaurus, yes. Daspletosaurus, not so much. If you saw Daspletosaurus late in the evening walking through Alberta, you would have said, that's Tyrannosaurus, run. You know, you wouldn't have said, oh, that's Daspletosaurus. It's nowhere near as, you know, as nasty as Tyrannosaurus. Um, but after that, it's another gap of almost 40 years before we get another Tyrannosaur in North America. We're still finding Tyrannosaurus rex. Remember during this time or the 90s, we're finding Tyrannosaurs on Fort Peck Reservoir. They're going to uh, Museum of the Rockies. There's more Tyrannosaurs being found in South Dakota, uh, both on the tribal lands, both on private lands, BLM lands. Tyrannosaurs are being found all over the place. But there's a new species or new genus in, in described in 2010. This is one from the... Uh, uh, Bistai Dinazen Wilderness in uh, northwestern New Mexico. Um, excavated out of a wilderness. This is the anniversary of the Wilderness Act, and this is probably going to become one of the one of the icons of the wilderness uh, um, of the Wilderness Act celebration. Fifty years of wilderness right now, and uh, uh, and if you can't say Bistai Eversir, because I can't even say it, uh, it's Bistai Eversir. Vista Heat Eversor Celii. Or you can just call it the Vistai Beast, which we like to call it the Vistai Beast. And we're still, uh, you know, uh, having chats with a fellow by the name Dr. Carr. Thomas Carr uh, gave it that name. We're still having some discussions with him. So, Daspli uh, Teratophonius. Uh, one year later, when 40 years without a new genus, one year, another one. This time from Grand Staircase Escalante um, National Monument, Southern Utah, also on BLM lands. Um, Teratophonius is much smaller than the others. It was only about 15 feet tall. 
you know, half the size of Tyrannosaurus rex, plenty large to, to uh, uh, get your attention. Lythronax, described last fall. So we've known about Lythronax for about six months now. But, you know, in four years, we have three new species of dinosaur, uh, of, of Tyrannosaur, all in the Tyrannosaur family, Tyrannosauridae family. Um, very closely related, different genera, but very, very closely related. And there's a few others uh, closely related in Canada that I'm not talking about now, Gorgosaurus, Albertosaurus. I mean, if you're really keeping track of them all, you're like, wait a minute, aren't there like three more from China too? That's right. And, and what's the one from Mongolia? You know, Tarbosaurus. I mean, there, there's others. One was just in the news about just less than a month ago called Pinocchio Rex because there's a really long snout. That's in China. There's this Chinese Tyrannosaurid. Um, little distantly related. These are all in North America, all in the U.S., and recently all found on public lands. And if that wasn't enough, so we're putting together a Smithsonian exhibits, Smithsonian's bringing in a new dinosaur, and we're saying, you know, let's bring in some more dinosaurs and have a, a reunion, a dinosaur reunion. But it's now it's getting confusing because Smithsonian's getting a dinosaur, BLM's bringing in a few dinosaurs, we just named Lythronax. So there's all this dinosaur stuff in the news, and if I'm getting confused, it's everyone's getting confused. Because all of a sudden, one day, just a couple of months ago, oh yeah, there's Nanukosaurus, another Tyrannosaur described from BLM lands, this time out of Alaska. A Tyrannosaur from Alaska. I mean, we went from just knowing about Tyrannosaurus and Daspletosaurus, and boom. And you always see, you know, where are the intermediate fossils? You never find the intermediate fossils. There they are. And if you look at all of them next to each other, which you can now do at the Smithsonian, is see all these specimens whoop, lined up right next to each other. When has that ever happened? Never. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to the reunion here in a moment. So I just have to throw it out there. There are four new species of Tyrannosaur from BLM administered lands in just the last five years. Wow. So let's talk about shift just a little bit and talk about the museums. You know, uh, New York has a Tyrannosaur. They have, this is a, a new mount of the specimen that was originally put up in, in 1915. Uh, Pittsburgh has the original holotype that was discovered in 1902. Uh, Chicago has Sue, the one that was uh, confiscated in, in uh, um, South Dakota. It found its way to Chicago. $8.3 million later, it, there it is. Chicago has its own dinosaur. Alberta has this beautiful dinosaur uh, uh, mount there. Uh, the one in Denver, this is, this is a cast, actually, of the New York specimen. But, but first of all, every major national natural history museum seems to want to have a tyrannosaur. I wonder why. Because I work on these pig-like mammals, and they're not asking for pig-like mammals in every single natural history museum in the world. But for some reason, they want these tyrannosaurs. And uh, I, I love that. I love that pose. And everyone says that pose is everything from its dancing to uh, it's peeing on a fire hydrant. I've heard. Um, I think it actually looks like it's winding up to pitch, you know, pitch a ball. But I, it, it's, it's it's a really fun mount to look at. But who's missing a tyrannosaur? Washington D.C. Thus, the Museum of the Rocky specimen. It's coming to D.C. actually arrived in the middle of March. It's over at Smithsonian now. It's going to take about uh, most of a year, probably another six months, to go unpack all the crates, and they're digitally scanning each specimen, and they're doing some fine uh, prep on the specimens. The specimens have already been prepared, so it's, it's mostly it's re-preparing it. But they're also scanning detailed submillimeter scanning, digital scanning, uh, three-dimensional scanning of the entire skeleton. You could rapid prototype that skeleton now, you know, with the 3D printers. I mean, technology has just gone nuts. And with all that data, um, you know, presumably you could you could just send, you could put that whole dinosaur onto one of these thumb drives, and then I'll take it somewhere and create a dinosaur out of it. I mean, it's a brave new world we're in. Yes? Are they trying to extract DNA? Uh, yes, yes, they are trying to extract DNA, but not from this specimen. There's another specimen called the Pex Rex that's also at the Museum of the Rockies, where they have 
extracted, um, well, they say they've extracted DNA. I'll go as far as say they've extracted uh, proteins, which they can back code into certain DNA. Um, I'm not completely up on the research they've done so far on that, but yes, they are looking for DNA. The thing is that even when they do find DNA in fossils, it's very unlikely you're going to find a complete strand of DNA. Um, but, you know, there's always frog DNA you can fill it in with. I mean, that was a brilliant, brilliant, you know, science fiction idea to fill it in with frog DNA, but we're not going to fill it in with frog DNA, and we're not going to be seeing dinosaurs walking around anytime soon. Um, but we are going to have a tyrannosaur here in Washington, D.C. They have what they call the Rex Room at the Smithsonian right now. Those are crates with the actual bones in it. They're pulling those bones out one bone at a time, scanning them, uh, setting that all up. And Smithsonian had a big gala press event. Everyone came in to see their new dinosaur, but their new dinosaur was in crates. So, you know, director of Smithsonian moves over here to the BLM dinosaur to do his, do his uh, uh, press announcements because there it is. Uh, so what we have is an exhibit at Smithsonian right now with Tyrannosaurus rex. That's actually a, a cast of the American Museum specimen because the new Tyrannosaurus specimen is undergoing preparation and everything else. Um, right next to it is Lythronax. Next to that is our Bisti beast. And then over here is Teratophonius. And remember we talked about the these test? Where? Oh, these are at Smithsonian in the, in the Rex room. In the Rex room. It's just off the, the main the foyer when you walk in. And, uh, oh, they're there. They're the first big four uh, Tyrannosaur skulls on your left. Um, <laughs> and, um, and yeah, as I said, the, there'd be a test afterwards, so you can remember, you know, Lythronax is on the, in, on the left there, Teratophonius on the right. Um, but there's more to it than this. Remember I said we spent 100 years where this was kid stuff, you know, children work on dinosaurs? Well, so this is the family reunion, but the family reunion, this in itself is just putting up some cool skulls. This is the kid stuff, this is the part that's really neat, and this is the hyperbole part which of course means it's my favorite part. But there's more to it than that. There's also the research. There is also some real research going on. Um, they would be looking for DNA if, if, this, if this specimen was preserved in a way that it could preserve DNA. Um, some really neat stuff going on with that. Everything from studying how these things bit, what they did, and, and what happens at a family reunion, you know, is when you go to a family reunion, sure, it's great to see old Aunt Bessie and Uncle Bill and all these folks that you haven't seen since you were eight years old. Um, but there's something funny that happens at family reunions if you've been to a family reunion. And you say, hey, Dad's nose looks like Uncle Bill's nose. I never noticed that before. You visit them all the time, but you never see them all together in the same place. When you have them all together in the same place, researchers are going to come from around the world for the opportunity to look at these specimens all in one place. Because otherwise, they're going to have to go out to Utah to look at one, out to New Mexico to see another, uh, here to Washington, D.C. to see the other. And so that's one of the values of having them all in one place at one time for research. You're going to see things that you're not going to normally see. So in the collections at the Smithsonian, the part that's not on display is all the stuff that's not so sexy. And, you know, a portion of Jaws kind of sexy. But, you know, these rib fragments, uh, little uh, parts of uh, wrist bones, there's actually a little, there's a broken tooth over there in the lower right. Um, this is what's also at the Smithsonian for research. Um, they're all available, and, and that's the other part of the family reunion. It's not just the skulls on display, but it's also the research opportunities that, that are coming out of this. And, and like I say, you normally you wouldn't put something like that on display because it's just it's not very exciting. Uh, not exciting to look at, but it's very exciting to work with if that's what you're, you're working on. The skulls um, are available. They can be brought back into the collections for work. The, uh, it's brought paleontologists in from all over the place. Uh, I like this because it's, it's like a grouping of all the paleontologists in Washington, um, minus about two. Um, so, and so 
it, it's a chance to bring not only the paleontologists together, not only the specimens together, the research together, and then the opportunity to see them all in one place. And that's our family reunion. It's the first time scientifically in 100 years that all these fossils have been brought together in one place. But if you're a tyrannosaur, it's the first family reunion in 65 million years. So, you know, depends how you look at it. Thus the hyperbole. So, our ambassador to science, icon for paleontology. I still love that absolute warlord of the earth. I got to remember that one. <laughs> um, so where do we go from here? What's going to happen now? Well, you know, what, what will happen in the next 100 years? And that's something to think about. And that's really the, the responsibility we have to start thinking about now. Um, with Tyrannosaurus rex, with the ambassador to paleontology, the ambassador to science, what happens to Tyrannosaurus rex is going to be an indicator of what's going on in paleontology, which is an indicator of what goes on in science in general. And in science, we do more than just science. There's so many other things happening. There's going to be more movies with Tyrannosaurus. And the big question is, is Tyrannosaurus going to be the villain or the good guy? Or kind of that revisionist little bit of both. The artwork. The artwork on the dinosaur artwork has just gone crazy in the last 20 years. The the quality is just unbelievable. And it's getting to the point where some of these pieces of artwork are more valuable than some of the fossils on a, on a strictly on a market sense. There's just some amazing stuff going on. Um, Luis Ray, who did all of these here, uh, he did a rendering of tyrannosaurs with feathers on them. And he was putting feathers on dinosaurs before paleontologists were putting feathers on dinosaurs. Why? Because he's an artist. Artists are allowed to break the rules. If a scientist says, I think it had stripes or I think it had spots, you know, you're like, well, what's your basis for saying that? You know, I mean, there's a little rigor involved. The artist has the license to take it one step beyond that step of rigor, you know? Okay, I'm gonna take everything you know scientifically. I'm gonna say, but you know what? What if it had feathers? Why not? It could have feathers. Well. You know, Luis is good friends with Bob Barker, the heresies, you know, and and so some people love this stuff and other people are like, dude, you're sending it the wrong direction. The public's getting the wrong idea. They're going to start thinking that Tyrannosaurus Rex had feathers on it. And uh, Luis has done some other things. Uh, there's his Tyrannosaurus next to the chicken or rooster. Just scaled it up, showing, you know, some, some biomechanical things. Kind of fanciful, kind of fun, but it also gets you thinking. And uh, true story, um, this was around uh, 2000, I want to say it was 2001, but I can't remember exactly, we around 2000, they started finding feathered dinosaurs in China. Not a feathered Tyrannosaurus rex, but some feathered dromaeosaurs, which are very closely related to Tyrannosaurus rex. The major point was 1996, the meeting in New York. The meeting in New York in 1996, was it earlier than I remember it then? Um, and uh, they, they announced that they were finding these, these feathered dinosaurs. But I remember Luis, when he learned this, that they had found feathers on dinosaurs, because he'd been putting feathers on his reconstructions for a long time. And, uh, you know, you never saw someone so happy, you know, <laughs> validated. And, and it, well, he wasn't a zealot about it by any means. Oh, I think they all had feathers. He was just like, what if they had feathers? Wouldn't that be neat? And... Um, so, you know, it, it, it was really neat because you can try things on in art. You can try things on that a scientist would say, you know, that's, that's not rigorous. But the artist has the license to try it and see. And in this case, Luis was right. But, you know, fantastic artwork. What's going to happen in the future with the management of fossils? Where are we going to be? Are we going to know what we're doing? Are we going to understand who owns them, what, how we manage them, what we do with them? Is our Justice Department going to understand how we prosecute, how we deal with them? Or is our law enforcement going to understand what our rules are, what we want, how we want to manage them, how they need to be managed, what the laws say about doing with them? Uh, you know, right now, uh, Homeland Security, Department of State are dealing with requests from foreign countries saying, you know what, our dinosaurs were stolen and shipped to the U.S. Could you send them back to us? Whoa, big question. You're sitting at the Department of State. You're dealing with, like, very important things, and someone wants their dinosaur back. And you're like, 
what are the rules on dinosaurs? This is the next 100 years. This is what's in front of us. An international trade, not only in selling dinosaurs, but also in the research, in the understanding, in the intellectual property. What if we do a three-dimensional scan of a Tyrannosaur and put it on a, a card like this? Can I give it to China? You know, uh, That's the next big questions in paleontology. And finally, where is the research going to go? Not only how they're related to each other, not only the dino DNA, as we say, uh, that's been found, but you know they actually have been finding strands of DNA, strands of, of soft tissue, and, and I think, if not DNA, uh, proteins. They're actually finding actual tissue from dinosaurs in the fossils. Um, the fossilization process usually is a replacement process, so it's boom, one for one replacement. So like petrified wood, there's, there's no original wood in petrified wood, but it maintains all of the structure because the structure of the wood was at a, at a molecular level was replaced one for one. So all of those uh, carbon atoms are replaced with silica atoms, and now you have a silicified or a petrified tree. And there's still the tree rings and everything else in it. What if you start finding some original tendon, sinew, blood from millions of years ago? Whole new thing. And who's going to recognize this? The geochemists, the, the biologists, the anatomists. This is where it's become a much more integrated science. It's not just a guy sitting in the field with a pickaxe, you know, prying that skull out and putting it on display. And then the last thing I want to show is how important are public lands? How important are they going to be in the next 100 years when we're looking at dinosaurs, when we're looking at paleontology, when we're looking at science? Public lands are the biggest scientific laboratory in the world. That's why we have to think about regions, ecosystems, large areas. And we're not just talking about modern ecosystems, but paleo ecosystems as well. You want to talk about questions of global climate change, you know, don't ask a, a meteorologist. They'll tell you what the weather's done for the last hundred years. But who's asking the deep time questions? When was the last time the Earth did what it's doing now? And how are we going to know? We're going to know by the signal that was left in the life that lived on planet Earth a long time ago. That's called paleontology. That is not kid stuff. And uh, that's some of the stuff that, that's so important here. Notice that Tyrannosaurus has been found on all sorts of public lands. In, in, in the one you can't really see, the Cheyenne River uh, Sioux Tribe, you know, since they have a couple of Tyrannosaurus out of the areas. And I, I stuck in the Park Service one at the end for two reasons. Uh, one, because I, I knew Vince was going to be here, and so I had to throw something for Park Service. But also, uh, Big Bend National Park actually has a, a partial Tyrannosaur specimen. So, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty neat about that, too. But anyway, we just have to think about this whole regional look, not just today, but the paleo-regional uh, look at what was going on. And that's where these public lands are going to be so important in the next 100 years to not just learn more about Tyrannosaurus rex, but also paleontology, which is an indicator of what's going on in science in general. And, um, and then the final question, of course, is who's going to attend the next reunion? How many more species are waiting out there to be discovered? And all these tyrannosaurs. And every time you see a tyrannosaur, remember that there's a bunch of other little, uh, Alice and I were laughing yesterday about little ostracods. I should give a talk on ostracods. You know, would we fill the room if we're talking about little fossil ostracods? But when you talk about paleo ecosystems and all, they're just as important. In fact, they might be a little more important. I mean, for what we can learn from them from the science. But, but what are we going to learn about Tyrannosaur in the next 100 years? So, anyway, thank you.